we've been talking about Brexit and, and the possibility of a no-deal Brexit for the better part of almost five years now. Um, and yes. yet here we are two weeks before the deadline. No-deal Brexit does certainly appear to be a high probability at this point. Uh, the European Commission have put in plan uh, some put in place the propositions to help ease the blow come January the first. Uh, overnight, they released these contingency plans for road travel, air, fisheries, etc. Um, putting all of that together, if we do end up in a No Deal Brexit scenario, how will those contingency plans soften the blow? And what do you think this means for the future of the trade discussions between the two? Well, uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me on, on this program. Um, it will soften the blow in the, long, in the short term. But the problem is, in, in the long term, it does not help certainty, particularly for the small and medium-sized enterprises. The big firms, the big uh, financial district, et cetera, they will find their way. I have no doubt that they will. But when you begin to look at the impact on, on um, travel, on the impact on exports and imports, that most of the small and medium-sized enterprises rely on, the level of uncertainty and unpredictability combined with COVID is going to be catastrophic in my view. It's going to be um, very difficult. Um, many of the, the, the MSMEs who've already indicated who uh, export almost 50% and import almost 50% from the EU recognize that they don't have the wherewithal to understand what the implications are, what the measures are, um, one third of the income that they earn comes from uh, trade with Europe. So there's significant implications, even if the, the short term measures are put in place to ease uh, what could be a no deal Brexit. The, the fact is that the implications for small and medium sized enterprises, when you look at queuing at the borders, when you look at standards and certification requirements, when you look at the permits that have been granted, only 2,000 for long, long haulers um, and 10,000 are needed. How is that going to affect trade uh, with Europe? Um, the channel might close. So these are the kinds of things that while, you know, on, on, a, on a negotiating table sound good, um, for long-term SME predictability and stability, it, it can be uh, very, very difficult. Well, turning to trade more broadly, uh, what we saw under uh, the Trump administration was this pivot to an America first policy and uh, a trade war with China. And on the back of that, even before the pandemic, we saw global trade volumes drop quite substantially. How do you think the worldview has changed uh, and their approach toward ch trade is going to change on back of the pandemic, which obviously was a huge shock to the global economic system, but also in many ways amplified the need for countries to work together. Well, yes, I think that there are two elements here which, which have, in a way, created a perfect storm, but a good storm, in the sense that, first of all, the COVID pandemic has underlined very clearly the need for a robust and healthy multilateral trading system. And I think that has been underscored more than anything else by what has occurred in COVID. The second issue is the, the potential um, uh, changed approach of a new US administration. Um, there are indications already that they intend to rejoin the Paris Agreement. They also intend to rejoin the WHO. Um, they've indicated that they want to have a, an engagement that is more positive with the World Trade Organization and that they intend to, in, in a sense, say that multilateralism is back. So I think a combination of both the COVID uh, pandemic and a new US administration will hopefully create a, a more positive outlook for multilateralism in the coming year. Um, you combine that, of course, with uh, a new WTO Director General, who we hope uh, will be finalized shortly, um, hopefully early in the new year. And then they will have the MC12, um, which will hopefully um, spawn a new multilateral approach uh, to international trade and uh, increase stability and predictability for all the countries that are engaged in, in this dynamic. 
Uh, Pamela, um, go ahead. Sorry, hmm? I just wanted to take this um, this conversation further when it comes to uh, global supply chains and the integration of various supply chains across the world. Putting politics aside and looking at what the pandemic has highlighted, early on there were concerns in the pharmaceutical sector, for example, that countries had become too dependent on other countries to access uh, their essential goods. For example, the Euro Europe and the U.S. They they, there were some nerves that given the dependence on China and India to produce generic drugs, we could see major supply shortages. So from that perspective, do you think that as a result of the pandemic, we're going to see countries bring some of those supply chains back in-house onshore? I think that there will be uh, some movement towards nearshoring. Yes, I, I think so. There's that tendency and, and the pandemic has kind of, you know, um, brought about a, an increased level of, of assessment of whether the level of dependence on long, long, long shore and um, offshore dependence on, on, on global value chains is really something that they want to continue. But at the same time, nearshoring won't necessarily solve the problem because the truth is we are so integrated globally that nearshoring will not necessarily address the issues of um, production of the vaccine, for example, the distribution of the vaccine, how it will uh, work across uh, the, the long value chains that have existed. I think part of the issue is um, there's a need, I think, to slow down a little bit and to assess whether um, a knee-jerk reaction to what the pandemic has shown is necessarily the best long-term solution um, to global value chains. Um, I think that in the final analysis, the, the, the global trading arena is so deeply integrated that it will be hard for nearshoring uh, to take place effectively in the short term. There will be some value chains that will move, but when it comes, for example, to the vaccines and medical supplies and distribution, I think that what we should be looking at is how can we ensure that developing countries and develop work together in the long term to ensure that all get access to the type of uh, medicines and pharmaceuticals that are needed.